Turn to Judges 7 tonight, if you will. We're going to be looking at a passage the Lord has given us. Well, a familiar passage, I'm sure, Gideon's army. Now, in this passage, we have set forth God's preparation of an army that would give all glory to him because it would be so small that there was no way they could take credit to themselves. Now here you know, I'm sure, the account of how God told Gideon to call an army for the deliverance of the people from the Midianites. He told them that if there were any fearful, verse 3, that they could go back to their tents. Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there returned of the people... 22,000, there remained 10,000. So two-thirds of them went back. The Lord said to Gideon, The people are yet too many. Bring them down into the water, and I will try them for thee there. It shall be that of whom I say unto thee, This shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And of whomsoever I say unto thee, This shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. So he's making a divine selection, you see. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, Everyone that lappeth of the water with his tongue as a dog lappeth, him shalt thou set by himself, likewise everyone that boweth down upon his knees to drink. The number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, were three hundred men, but the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. The Lord said to Gideon, By the three hundred men that lapped will I save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand, and, of course, to send the others back. Now, the account is familiar to us here. In fact, we've got a study on that, on Gideon's army. And tonight we want to deal with some admonitions concerning end-time preparation tonight and next week or however long the Lord gives us studies in this area. We'll be dealing with some admonitions concerning our end-time preparation. The subject tonight is classification in God's army. Classification in God's army. Now you'll notice here that one classification eliminated most of them, two-thirds, the classification of the fearful. Now, when the military calls men up in a draft, they select them, classify them according to their physical condition, and they reject those who are physically unfit. Now, God in this end time, actually beginning about 1900, but especially in these last days, has been preparing an army. Some of that earlier work was preparatory, but he's preparing an army of people And he is classifying them according to their spiritual condition. And just like in Gideon's army, he's rejecting those who are unfit for service. If it's a lack of faith and they're fearful, it may be that they are morally and spiritually weak or sick. It may be they're not prepared for spiritual warfare, and that has to be known by you, by all of us, before God sends us into battle. And just like in Gideon's army, there are three classifications. The fearful, the failures, and the faithful. Now the question is tonight, to which group do you belong? To the 22,000 that return? Two-thirds, do you belong to the two-thirds majority? The 10,000 who were failures? Or the little handful whether a handful out of this body or a handful out of Christendom, I don't know. We don't make those decisions or choices, but it could be just a handful out of a body here and a handful out of a body somewhere else. You can't assume because you're at the waters and drinking that that automatically makes you a soldier in the army of the Lord. Now, we could classify them in many ways. We could call them the longers. They long to go back to their tents. The lingerers, they linger too long at the water. And the lappers. The longers are those who, after the battle starts, wish they'd never joined the army in the first place. They long and yearn to go back to their tents because of fear. Well, fear is manifested in many forms. We've been dealing with it for several weeks. 
Then the lingerers who linger too long with their head down in the water, off guard, prove by the way they linger and the way they drink in this case that they're not prepared. And then there are the 300, that small group, the lappers, that this is too small a group for them to have any confidence in the flesh in themselves to deliver themselves by themselves out of the hands of the Midianites out there. And so their trust is totally in God. As we see in verse 7, they know it's God who will deliver them. The Lord said to Gideon, By the 300 men that lapped will I save you, deliver you, and I will deliver the Midianites into thine hand, and let all of the others go back to their tents, back to their place. Now these are solemn words to have God say to you, because of your fear, tell him, or because of a lack of preparation, tell her they failed their test. Tell them to go back to their tents. Solemn words. He's going to say that to a lot of people. He's going to say that to 99%, over 99%, because less than 1% passed the test. Less than 1%. 300 out of 32,000. Now, isn't it that way today? Can you find 300 faithful? Can you, by searching with a lamp, find 300? I mean, you as an individual outside this church, can you go anywhere? And let's leave out the churches that follow the faith message and that sort of thing. But I'm talking about in Christendom. Do you know 300 that would pass the test? That doesn't mean you could find 300 in some faith assemblies somewhere. 300. Well, some of them are not that large, like 40 or 50 people or 12 or whatever. Now, we're not speaking of salvation, but of service. Now, of course, fearful failures, doubtful people may also not be saved people in the final analysis, but that's not what we're confronted with here in Gideon's army. Selection was not on the basis of whether or not they were believers, but whether or not they were fearful or prepared. So we'll leave it at that. Let's look at these groups. First of all, the fearful. Now therefore proclaim, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart. And there returned 22,000, two-thirds. The fearful, the longers who long to go back to their tents, are those who didn't count the cost before they joined the army. They weren't prepared to pay the cost. And so they long, after the battles start, they long, they yearn to go back to their family tents where they're promised peace if they'll desert that army over there in the cornfield. Their denominational tents because they're fearful of what may happen to them if they belong to an army that's being assaulted on every hand, every side, and it's growing worse. The enemy doesn't decrease. The Midianites just seem to multiply by leaps and bounds. They're fearful of what will happen to them belonging to an army that requires rigid discipline in the ways of spiritual warfare. That takes time, as you know. What's going to happen to them in an army where the general is the Lord himself and he doesn't allow any gold bricking or sleeping on guard duty, but 24 hours of watchfulness Watch and pray. An army that doesn't have a rest area behind the lines that when you get wounded, you can go back and rest in the base hospital, the rest area from battle fatigue or wounds. But the heavenly headquarters says there's no let up. You've got to just keep on going, keep on marching without any let up, without any sympathy, without any purple heart for your wound. And that rest comes not behind the lines where you can go back and rest from battle fatigue, but rest comes when you conquer the enemy and take the land. That's when you get to rest. There's no rest, friends, this side of the promised land, believe it. In fact, you should already know it. An army that teaches its recruits that the fear of man brings a snare, but the fear of God, he'll keep you safe even as you battle. How unlike that is from the propaganda of some of the generals in the army of institutional religion. Here's what one general said. 
Teaching the fear of God is what turns man away from God. This is what separates man from God, teaching him to fear God. Well, on the contrary, it's sin that separates man from God, and the fear of man is one of those sins that will separate you from God. If you fear man more than God, you better believe he'll separate himself from you. And so do you or will you, as some have, fear what the Midianites might do to you? If you remain in the army of the faithful, the army that's in preparation, any number have, due to fear, left the army, deserted their AWOL right now from the army of God. Do you, like them, sometimes find yourself longing to go back to Egypt, back to your family tent where you can have peace? How many of you, your families have promised to be at peace with you if you'll just forsake, desert that army over there at Faith Assembly? Do you long to go back to your denominational tents? Some have gone back to Goshen, back to Egypt. Do you long to pitch your tents once more in the broad way? The narrow way is getting kind of lonesome. You long to go back because of financial fears and worries, and people have those. Remember, that's the second worry that people have, fear of sickness being the first. We've taught you that, shown you that. But do you long to go back to the bank of the Nile? where you can borrow for your Buick, where asked if you follow this army, you're expected to believe God for your finances, and it may take a little longer because he's trying to work faith in you. And you can get it in a hurry down at the bank of Egypt, bank of the Nile. Do you have fear and no faith because you find there's too much month left at the end of the money too often? So you long to go back to the easy way, even if it does cost you an arm and a leg. Or long to go back to the physicians of Egypt, to taking their pills, their vitamins, their diets, their exercises, all of that, you know. Instead of trusting, of course, in 1 Timothy 4 for all of that. Well, Paul says exercise profits a little, but as I've said before, I'm not going to get paranoid over it. As millions have done, years ago there were 23 million joggers. Today it's much, much higher. Just think, 23 million. And that was years ago when that survey was made. Well, I agree with someone who said, I jotted down what someone said about jogging, said the first time that I see a jogger with a smile on his face, I'll consider taking it up. <laughs> well, I can agree with that. Or do you, as some long to go back to the old ways because of fear of too much media and too little medicine. Some have gone back to Egypt because of that. They went back to their tents because of that. Well, of course, you know the story on that. If you give in to the fear of man because of what he says or because of a lack of medicinal treatment, why then you're not fit for the army of God. And yet the fearful will hear the word of faith, hear the message of healing, and go back to their oxygen tents, go back to their hospital homes, go back to their tiresome religious temples of man. Well, I think you can see that the fearful have already left. I'm going to assume that anyway. Obviously, and I'll give you the benefit of the doubt, you're not among that first group of 22,000 or you wouldn't be here. Now, that's spoken in the context of the fact we realize that people who are here now won't be here six months from now. But nevertheless, we'll give you the benefit of the doubt that you're not fearful, you don't belong to that group because you're here. But the question is, do you belong to this next group described in verses 3b through 7, the failures? A third of them failed. Two-thirds were fearful, went back to their tents because of fear of whatever kind or description, but these are failures in verses 3 to 7. This is why God allows us to be tested and tried to see whether or not before he sends us into battle we're going to fail or pass. In other words, it will prove to you whether or not you've counted the costs first. That's why the trials and the tests. 
See, God already knows, and you can be thankful he doesn't always show you what he knows, but what about yourself? What do you know about it? Are you failing now in time of trial? Do you turn to the arm of the flesh? Some do, whether it's counsel or help or treatment or finances or whatever. As soon as the trial starts, they've got to get on the phone and call somebody. They've never learned yet to cope for themselves. And, of course, that's spelled faith. Now, I'm not talking about what I'm not talking about. Keep a balance. But I'm just saying, where are you in time of trial? Now, God has many ways to allow us to be tried down through the waters of testing. I want to deal with some tonight and see how you're doing in some of these areas. One test, he allows the test of your love for him he allows a test of your love for him by your response to his instruction and his correction through the word or through his anointed minister. What is your response? He tests your love for him through his corrective word, instructive and corrective. Now the question is, now look at your own life. Don't look around. Don't think about your neighbor, your brother, sister. But how do you respond to correction from the Word of God? From the counsel of an anointed minister of God. I'm talking about one that God has set in ministry. Or from chastisement from God. What is your response? Do you humbly submit to correction and lap it up as from the Lord? Some do, some don't. Or do you fail your test as some have by burying your head in the waters of self-pity and injured feelings. Oh, some just, they can't take any correction, can't take any instruction, not even the pastor. They get hurt feelings. He doesn't understand my case. It's hard to sit there at faith assembly. You never know what's coming next. That's right. I don't either when he gives me the word. I don't know what's coming next. So have you responded in such a way that God sees you love him because he loved you, Hebrews 12, enough to correct you with his word? Without some chastisement, or even if it were chastisement, how did you respond to that? Why, Lord? I don't deserve this, Lord. But you, many times, we're talking to those who do not respond properly, many times they can receive chastisement but they don't want God to chasten them with his word. They'd rather have the whip because they don't want it through an earthen vessel like themselves. Now, you have to listen carefully, friends, because you know in your heart some of you are guilty of this. You attempt to justify yourself. You don't always heed the word. And then if you get a message coming your way with your name and address on it, or maybe something even more direct through counsel or whatever, a phone call, what is really in your heart? Do you say, praise the Lord, brother, praise the Lord, pastor, for showing me that? That's going to help me to walk in that narrow path and be a part of Gideon's army and not miss being an overcomer. Is that your response? I've got a couple of letters that came to me not too long ago concerning some correction, some admonishment. I gave a couple of the ministers about a certain matter. You know what their response was? They didn't get upset. They wrote letters to me and thanked me for the correction. Now that's the spirit in which to receive the word of the Lord. It shows you love the Lord. You stop looking at the vessel through whom the correction's coming. He could even use an enemy, and if it's truth, you ought to receive it. I have. There have been cases where I've received things that people weren't exactly offering me plaudits or patting me on the back. I remember one time when I was preaching my heart out on a certain subject, and a woman came after, in a meeting where I was speaking, came after and said, well, you've really got the word of the Lord. Praise the Lord for that. Now I'm going to pray he'll give you his love, too, as you minister it. Well, friends, I didn't get upset. I received that. Because while I didn't agree off the top of my head with what she said, 
I receive that as, is that from the Lord? I'm going to examine myself and examine the way I present the message and on and on. Oh, I profit by those things. You can tell when it's just base criticism. And you can let that roll off you like water off a duck's back. That isn't the first time some person has tried to admonish me. And if it's from the Lord, in fact, in another meeting in that same state, I believe, someone else corrected me. The way I handled a prayer for somebody to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. To make a long story short, he just kept saying, I can't, I can't, I can't speak in tongues, I can't receive. I simply said, son, you'll never receive, saying you can't receive. And I moved on to the next person. We had a whole room of people who wanted to receive the Holy Spirit. So the young lady criticized me for that. I should have stayed there all night, was her attitude, and tried to get him to overcome his doubts. Well... If we had one person we were dealing with and had all night, that might be another subject. She came upstairs the next day after I spoke and said, I want to apologize to you. The Lord corrected me last night. And in effect said, he's my minister and you should not talk to him that way. He knows what he's doing. Something to that effect. I don't try to remember the words. But I didn't reject that. But the Lord corrected her in that case. But I'm saying, dear friends, how do we respond? If your immediate response is to be offended, is to justify yourself rather than crucify yourself, you failed your test down at the waters when the test came. You see, some people grumble and some are humble at correction. Some people will grumble when they get corrected through the word or through some other maybe direct means. They'll grumble to themselves or they'll grumble to their wives or grumble to their husbands about that preacher or he misunderstands me or whatever. And so if your response is, I receive that, you passed your test. If your response is not, I receive that, I resent that, you failed your test. Because if you're right, and I've said it 10,000 times, you don't have to justify yourself. If you're wrong, you're guilty of two sins, the sin and justifying yourself because you sinned. So God tests us, and this is a hard test to pass, let's face it, to be corrected by others, especially when they're right. You thought I was going to say especially when they're wrong. No, it hurts more when they're right. You find out, well, that is right. I didn't present that the way I should, or I didn't heed the pastor's admonition or whatever. I want to say I don't get many letters from anybody in the church that's been corrected. I've had letters that correct me saying, well, you were wrong. You didn't understand my case. Well, friends, all I can say is that even if I were wrong, you didn't die at that point. The purpose of the correction, if it was from the pulpit, a general type correction or whatever, is to straighten out our lives or to humble us or to crucify us. And you can never crucify the old self-life as long as you are not humbly receiving the correction or if you're writing letters to the pastor to show him where he missed it. Now, not many do that, but we've had that. But praise God for the letters, or it isn't always a letter, a phone call, or come by and say that I received that. And if you need to name me publicly to help others, you go ahead and do it. Now, that's a spirit that means a person is pretty well dead. I had a brother say, you can just mention my name in public and tell what it did if it will help somebody else not to make that mistake. Well, I know why it's quiet, because we're talking to you where you live, every one of you, all of us. I've experienced it. I'm no different than you. I've experienced it. I've had to die to it. Even when I think people are wrong, well, as I say, if it's just base criticism, that's another matter. I don't fly off the handle. I just ignore it. But if somebody who thinks they're trying to help you, even though I believe they were wrong, I have thanked them and said, I'll take it before the Lord. I believe I'm right, but I'll take it before the Lord. Never get so big in your own eyes in ministry. And remember, we're all in ministry. In your Christian walk, your charismatic life, that you're so big that you cannot admit you're wrong or at least be humble about correction. God tests our love at that point. Well, we could go all night here. Another way he tests us is 
He tests our loyalty to him in the area of confession, what we say, our witness, whether or not we are afraid to witness, or whether or not we are making positive confessions in our testimonies at church and negative confessions to the Lord in prayer, or at home. You ever catch yourself making a negative confession? Why, of course you have, so you have to correct it. He tests us in our conduct if we are walking in his ways or the ways of the world. And here again, the heart, the attitude. How do you respond to his instruction concerning, well, whether or not you are cloning the world in the way you dress and talk in your interests? Does that bother you? Do you give that up reluctantly? Do you drag your feet to get those old sodomite shoes off or you just kick them off when you hear that that's <laughs> worldwide knowledge that the sodomites started that business. And so disloyalty is so commonplace today in the church that people look upon their behavior as the norm, their disloyalty, and think people like us who teach on separation from the world and its ways, morals and ethics, positive confession, they think we're odd. Well, we are, <laughs> but in the right way. Here's what one said. We're talking about being disloyal to God. If you make a negative confession when God has said something in his word, then you make a negative confession. Here's what one teacher said, and of course thereby failed the test. You should learn the will of God. They were teaching on the will of God. You should learn the will of God and do it. Personally, I pray for God to show me his will in a matter before taking some course of action. Now listen to this. Actually, however, I often already know God's will in the matter, but I just don't want to do it. Of course, they're praying to bring God over to their side. What is the moral? Do as I say, not as I do. Negative. Here's what some that I've read said in their ministries, if God stops providing for this ministry, I'll stop preaching his word. Now that's disloyalty. He proves our loyalty to him by allowing tests of our faith in the financial area. Our Lord, it's been three weeks since I was prayed for. I prayed for my own healing and I'm nothing better. I don't understand it. I'm going to give it a couple more days, and if you don't do something, I'm going to go back to the arm of the flesh. Of course, they never say that. Back to their pills. Back to the doctor. But disloyalty is so commonplace, and we've got a book full of negative confessions in the Positive Thinking and Confession book. If you want to read some of the things that people say, we've given some of them to you many times. But disloyalty concerning confession is so commonplace by the denominational disciples that they think such negative confessions, as we just cited, are the norm. They don't see them as abnormal, is what I'm saying. For a teacher to stand up and say, now do as I say, but don't do as I do. Seek the will of the Lord, so you'll do his will. But often I already know his will. I just don't want to do it, and so I'm praying about it. And people will follow that and send in their money, won't they, to support it. And then disloyalty in one's conduct by professing Christians is so commonplace, disloyalty in conduct, that many fail their test when God attempts to correct their way of life through his word, through teaching. Disloyalty in conduct is so commonplace that many fail the test. Well, just things we've taught here, friends, it took months and years in some areas to get people actually to face the issue that God was concerned about that in the life of the Christian, whatever it may be. Like, not every trashy vision went out in the garbage the first time we mentioned it, did they? Because it's a spirit. And so it takes real loyalty to God to face some of these things is what I'm talking about. In fact, some may still have trashy visions. That's not the issue. That's not the point. That's your choice. But you won't have time to watch it and prepare for ministry in God's end-time army. 
But we're saying that, well, some at faith assembly, instead of submitting to the word, when God tried to clean up their lives, their lifestyle, with the water of his word, instead of receiving that water and lapping it up as from the Lord, they buried themselves in the waters of criticism, plunged their heads in the pools of popular opinion. And so they left here saying legalism. They want to take away my trashy vision, or they won't let me dress and clone like the world. It's always they won't let. Of course, you don't see any lassos, guns, or handcuffs making people submit to the Lord on giving up the ways of the world. Or they've robbed me of all of my joy. I refuse to go to a church that won't let me listen to rock and roll, have oral sex, join a labor union, requires me to pay all of my income tax, and I can't attend Hollywood movies or have any cigarettes or wine with my meals. Well... God tests our loyalty by our response to correction, by our response to his word concerning confessions and conduct. There's so much could be said there, but we're just giving you the ideas in brief. Thirdly, he allows us to be tested concerning our word. He tests us by our loyalty to his word, and he allows us to be tested concerning our own words, you know, like truthfulness, honesty. Now, some fail the test here, even though they don't think they do, because they don't consider white lies, half-truths, exaggerations, and that sort of thing as a concern of God. It's only when you tell that big, blatant lie, like, you know, you're afraid you'll be fired if you speak in tongues. So, no, I don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit or whatever. They think if you don't tell a lie like that, it's not a lie. Some are going to be surprised when the Lord passes them by for selection in his end time army because they thought, you know, they were just right there with the Lord on truthfulness and honesty. But exaggeration can disqualify you, friends. Just exaggeration. And people are not immune to that, like when they give a testimony. Tell about how God delivered them out of an auto accident. Someone hit them from the rear at 35 miles an hour, demolished the car that hit them, and the person that hit them was injured, and God delivered them without a scratch. Praise the Lord. But as they get to telling it, the 35 gets speeded up to 55. And that's really, you know, helping God get more glory because they were hit by a car, not just traveling at 35, but 55. God doesn't need any of your help to give him extra glory. Don't exaggerate. Tell it like it is. People have been killed at 35. And so just don't exaggerate. Some ministers exaggerate about the results in their, well, their meetings. And I know of two cases where that, one admitted it was true, and the other has been charged of doing that. If a hundred are saved, it's five hundred. You know the story. Thirty receive the Holy Spirit is three hundred when they tell it. Now, some stories seem to improve with age, so you have to be on guard <laughs> that you don't adorn the gospel with your gospel when you tell it like the quarterback who made in 1938 made a 15-yard touchdown, they won the game. Over the years, that yardage kept increasing until at last he recovered a fumble on the opponent's one-yard line and ran 99 yards to a touchdown and no one could get near him. You ever heard any of those? Our implications, implications, you know, you imply that something is one way when actually it's another. Out of the fear of man you tell that, or out of pride, or for whatever reason. So don't exaggerate. Don't expand on the truth. Don't make anything greater or less than it really was, or better or worse. Don't expand on the truth, because if you do, then you are manifesting the same spirit that is in the media because they thrive on that. They always exaggerate and falsify. 
in a certain period of time, there were four deaths in faith assembly. You know what it was when they told it? Seventeen. They couldn't tell the truth if they were talking about their own mother's funeral. They'd mess it up, mix it up some way. So don't manifest that spirit that's in the media. And it's not just the people in the pew. It's the religious leaders too often that are not good examples to follow in the matter of honesty and truthfulness. And that is true. So say they're ministers who exaggerate the results. Now, you may not have that big a ministry as those two who were doing all of that exaggerating. In fact, they had such big ministries they didn't have to exaggerate. But nevertheless, the temptation can be there that, well, someone that was deaf got his ears opened, and the first thing you know, he was probably blind too. You know, you have to be careful. And so ministers are not immune to this. Cheating on exams, I've seen them do that, college and seminary. Religious schools, cheating on exams. Non-payment of debts. Ministers, yes. That's dishonest. That's not being truthful. You promised to pay when you bought it. In fact, years ago when I was in the seminary, I used to buy some used books from England, and they would send out a big list, several pages. And I remember one issue they sent out, I think the whole first page was a warning to ministers in America. If they didn't start paying their bills, they were going to list their names on this publication that went worldwide. And they said ministers in America are the worst people in the world concerning paying their debts. That in England they've never lost a penny by the ministers over there. They wouldn't think of reneging on a debt. You ought to see the stacks of pages that we've had over at Faith Publications. And some of them were in Faith Assembly that didn't pay their debts. Now we don't dun them. We're not going to garnish you your wages or sue you. <laughs> but I'm talking about all over where we send the literature, there was a whole list of people, and sometimes it ran into considerable money. Christians, dishonest. Are they Christians? God expects us to be truthful and to be honest, and so there are just some companies in America that don't want to give ministers credit. Of course, that's no problem here. We don't want it, but they don't want to give it because there's such deadbeats, ministers. So ministers and elders and deacons are not always the most trustworthy. It isn't just the people in the pews what I'm talking about. So if we're talking to you, then we're talking to all of us. I read somewhere about a Presbyterian elder, to give an example of dishonesty, who had an old rattle trap he wanted to sell. He had spent a fortune on it trying to keep the thing running. So he ran an ad in the paper. And a man came to look at it, and he said, does it run good? He says, perfect. Ever spend any money on it for repairs? Not a penny. Presbyterian elder. You can take my word for what I'm saying. I'm a Presbyterian elder. Well, he said, then I'll take it. I don't have the money with me. I'll send it to you in a week. I'm a Baptist deacon. You can take my word. <laughs> so... In the house, the Presbyterian elder trotted and laughing up his sleeve and said to his wife, I finally got rid of that old clunker that I spent so much money on. He said, by the way, what's a Baptist deacon? Oh, she said, you know, it's about the same as a Presbyterian elder. <laughs> oh, he said, oh my, I just lost my car. <laughs> How are you in this area? I mean, did you pass your test? I'm not going to ask you what grade you made because God doesn't grade on a curve. You either fail or pass. You're either honest or dishonest. You're not a little bit untruthful or a little bit dishonest. You either fail or pass. Well, here's another area that God tests us. He allows us to be tested, and you guessed it, in the area of faith. Now, this is the most important area not to fail. Test us in the area of our faith, at home, at work, in our ministries, for finances, for healing, in the area of persecution, the threat of jail or imprisonment. How is your faith in these areas? Do you praise the Lord or panic when God takes you down to the waters of testing in these areas concerning your faith or any area? 
Now, some, because of fear, fail their test. In the financial area, they run to the finance company fountain when their money well runs dry. Or they run to the water faucet to get water to take their pills three times a day when the well of faith for healing ran dry. But without your faith fountain flowing, you see, you're going to be in trouble eventually because the devil can and does put things on people who claim to be walking by faith that there's no cure for, medically no cure. Then what are you going to do if your faith fountain has run dry? And, of course, it's run dry for some people. Just many things that medical science cannot cure. But praise God, he says, there's nothing too hard for me. This came on a tape to me from England, the meeting over there, showing you how medical science often gives up people, but where medical science fails, God never fails. Here was a three-year-old daughter that had developed spinal meningitis. That was before divine healing came to them. They were Christians, but not charismatic, and took her to the hospital. And the father was telling this, that in the hospital, she was there three months, had over a hundred injections, and of course, whatever else they do. She was no better and was dying, and so they just gave her back to the parents and said, we can't do anything for her anymore. Take her home. She's dying. And he said the night that they brought her home, he was awakened with the daughter, three years old, screaming, and went down. She was burning up with fever, had glazed eyes, and was literally dying. He said, I just cried out, Jesus, Jesus. And he said, when I called on him, he answered. He came, stood right in the room, appeared, and said, fear not, I have healed her. And he did because he said the next morning she was normal, ran up the stairs, and got in bed with the parents. <laughs> well, praise the Lord because, you know, I got a sack full of letters and testimonies that are coming from this church and people who are related to it. And I'm really getting blessed. I've just gotten started in them. But I don't know how many, any number already where babies were born not breathing and not breathing for like up to 20 minutes or so forth. I guess that's dead. Or stop breathing, including some adults and that sort of thing. Besides all of the other healings, unusual healings. When I say unusual, I mean where it's something really serious. I don't mean like unusual that a finger was created or something, but that would be nice to report that. But I just mean a serious ailment. But you see, God doesn't say, as they said, take her home. We can't do any more for her. She's dying. And yet, in spite of the fact that medical science often hangs out its sorry, no help available sign, people will still go and trust in those broken cisterns that can hold no water, and praise them even for their failures. Here's a case. Listen to this. I am not quoting, but it is a patient that they had been experimenting on for years, testing and experimenting. They decided to run a rather radical experiment, and he died on their hands, I believe, on the operating table. And they began to praise the doctors. Listen to what they say. His case was a great aid to medical science while he was alive. We could test and experiment on him. But he makes even a greater contribution to medical science by his death. Now they can autopsy him. You know, take his brain out and his liver and all of that and see what made him tick before he died. I mean, they praise them for their failures. Well, now Jesus' friends did not go to the cross and suffer and die for our diseases. We're told he carried away our diseases. He bore away our pains. He didn't go to the cross to suffer and die for the church to put its trust in the arm of the flesh, man, and give him the glory as it does. And there's something to keep in mind that if Jesus healed before Isaiah 53 was fulfilled at the cross, and he healed before that, then certainly he would heal his people after he provided healing in the atonement. Remember, Matthew points to Isaiah's prophecy, which would be fulfilled in the cross when Jesus was healing. Why, he was already healing on the basis of providing healing in the atonement. 
If he's going to do it before, why common sense ought to tell anybody, a three-year-old, that he would certainly provide what he's promised in his word that he has provided, if we'll meet the conditions to receive it. So be sure that you do not do like the institutional church and fail to pass your test at this point, the point of faith. Because God says you're foolish. Remember our studies in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 2.13, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed themselves out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Now, Acts 10.38 tells us that Jesus came to deliver us from the oppression of the devil, and sickness is one of those deliverances. He healed all who were oppressed of the devil. Healed, delivered from the oppression of the devil. Then over in Mark chapter 7, we see that deliverance, and that includes healing, is the children's bread. And moreover, we're told that deliverance is the dog's bread, if they'll believe it. Because the woman said, even the dogs get to eat the crumbs under the table, Jesus said for that saying, go in peace, your daughter's delivered. Well, where does that leave the church today? They reject the children's bread. They reject the dog's crumbs. They side in with the world and bow down to their gods. And they oppress and criticize the children for wanting to eat the bread. And they kick the dogs because they want to eat the crumbs. Where does that leave them? What's left? What are they? You see, the only thing that you hear about or see in connection with a shepherd are the lambs, the sheepdogs, and the wolves. And if you're not going to be a lamb and eat the bread and follow the master and obey him, in this case in divine healing, if you're not going to be his sheepdog who will gladly eat the crumbs that fall under the table, that only leaves one category. A wolf in sheep's clothing, Jesus said, in religious garb. But they don't fool the true sheep because they neither sound like sheep and they're not following the master. They're making their own way. But we read over in Revelation chapter 14 that overcomers follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. You want to know if you're an overcomer? You're following the Lamb. In this case, the Lamb of God who is both the shepherd and the lamb. So the church today, because of its failure, is so used to failure that it teaches failure. It prays failure. It talks failure. I've got an article here, Thank God for Failure, and cites how that even Jesus failed at the cross. And that's a charismatic paper, friends. Here's a prayer of failure by a religious moralist, I guess, a prayer for the day. I heard him giving it. I jotted down as much as I could. Lord, grant me enough suffering to make me aware of the pain of others. Well, he'll get it, won't he? <laughs> grant me enough failure to keep me humble. Grant me enough rejection to know what it is to be lonely. Grant me enough criticism to appreciate any praise. Grant me enough lack of goods to know what it is to have something, appreciate what I have, and on and on. Now, if you want a lesson on how to fail, there it is. All you have to do to fail your test is to drink from such broken cisterns that can hold no water and reject the fountain of living waters. I've found that like attracts like. Failures attract failures. I mean, failures of every kind, individuals, Churches that preach and pray failure will attract failures. I read somewhere of a backslider always up and down, and one time while it was up, he decided to go to church. He went to two or three, wasn't satisfied. For whatever reason, they didn't minister to his condition. And he walked in one Sunday morning in a church where the pastor was praying, and you'll recognize it because if you've ever been to church, you've heard this prayer, Lord, we're such needy sinners. Lord, forgive us. We've left undone those things that we should have done, and we've done those things we shouldn't have done. So the old backslider slipped down in a pew and with a sigh said, well, I found my people at last. I mean, like attracts likes what we're saying. Faithful 
The third category, verses 6 and 7, the faithful. We had the fearful, we had the failures, and now the faithful. Now the faithful are those who showed by the fact they lapped the water, not falling on their faces in the water and burying their heads. They weren't looking for the enemy who was just over the hill. A host of Midianites that they couldn't number. And by cupping your hand and putting water in it and then standing up and drinking out of your hand. If you know anything about animals, animals don't plunge their heads under the water to drink, but they're watching all the time while they're lapping the water. You watch a dog, even a pet often will do that. And then in the midst of lapping the water, they'll raise their head and look all around, even when they're feeding. So they showed they were prepared by this action. And so God, in this end time, is going to deliver His people, as Gideon delivered Israel. He's going to deliver His people, not with the 32,000, He doesn't need them, but with 300. The small amount, the less than 1% in charismatic Christendom, or however He designs to make that selection. 300, of course, is a figure of a small amount. And he doesn't need the 300. But by his grace, he has chosen to use those of us who will remain faithful in spite of persecution, in spite of trials of faith, whether sickness or financial or family or whatever. Now, critics, because of our strong faith here, call us odd and odd people. Oh, they're odd in their beliefs and practices. They just lap up that word like a dog dying of thirst. And they just keep listening over and over to the same message on tapes till they wear it out because they don't want to drop a crumb. They're odd in their behavior, but you see what they don't realize, they are the ones that are odd to God. They're odd. You see, it depends on whose foot the shoe is on. Now those who reject the living waters of the Word reject the blood of Jesus for their healing and substitute the broken credo cisterns of man and the mutilation, the bloody mutilations of medical science for healing. They're odd to God. You better believe. After he sent Jesus to the cross to provide healing and then Christians turned to the empty cisterns of man, broken cisterns, such people are odd to God. I mean, wouldn't anyone think you were odd, say you lived in Arizona, where the temperature sometimes is well over 100, 110 on the desert? You had the option of buying a home, two identical homes, but one had a deep artesian well that sent forth, without any limited supply, cool, refreshing waters. And the other home, identical in every way, except it had a cistern. And even at that, a broken cistern. And you chose that? Wouldn't people think you're odd? And that's precisely what the church has done. They've turned away from the living waters that are clearly offered in the Word to the creedal cisterns of man, the dead denominational doctrine. That's why God says they're odd. Well, we've been called dogmatic, but that isn't the half of it. Because we teach a strong Word and teach that people should obey all of the Word. No, we're not dogmatic, we're bulldogmatic. <laughs> you better believe I intend to be bulldogmatic about the Word of God and teach people that God expects them to obey His Word. You tell me a church where the people for one moment take seriously what the minister says, even if he ever says anything and expect to obey it. Why, they will tell him in no uncertain terms what he can do with his message if he implies they are to go out and live it. But I agree with the mother who answered her little son about seven after the message was over one Sunday morning, turned to his mother and said, Mother, is it all done? She said, No, it's all just said. Now we're to go out and do what God said. Amen. It's just said tonight. I'm done. It's just said. Now we must go out and do it. 
Do you want to know something? You don't pass your tests for admission into Gideon's army, God's end time army, because you're in the presence of the water. 10,000 went down to the water. You're not admitted. You don't pass your tests because you drink of the water. You're drinking tonight. You want to know something? It's how you drink. What are you doing with the water you're drinking? Are you obeying it? Are you heeding it? There's some things we shouldn't have had to have preached on but once, but we find that we've had to say them over and over and over again. So it's what you do with the water. It's how you drink. It's all been said. Now it's to be done. Father, may every heart in the presence of the water tonight, every heart that drank of the water as they listened to it being distributed, be classified as those who are faithful, those who lap up the water of God's word as if they were dying of thirst, who cannot wait to come back to receive more of the living water, who have become dissatisfied over the years with man's cisterns of dry, creedal opinion, and who are willing to pay the cost for what it does cost to drink of this fountain, this living fountain of water, the word of the Lord. And impress upon all our hearts that it means nothing to be in the presence of the water, to drink the water, unless we drink properly and heed what the Spirit says through the water of the word is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Would you stand with us, please, and worship the Lord? Hallelujah. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. Thank you for your faithfulness and your mercy and your long suffering with us to bring us to this hour that we might hear the word of the Lord for the hour and be prepared, for we know the time is very short and that you've not let us fall by the wayside, but that we're still present, therefore there's still hope. And so we thank you for your mercy in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May God bless the word to your heart as you go out and do it. Amen.